Good morning, buenos dias. I am Clint Jaramillo, director of the LGBT Resource Center at UCSF. I am delighted to welcome you all to today's event celebrating transgender visibility in the sciences. I want to thank Gladstone's LGBT community group and the Graduate Queer Alliance for organizing this event. A special thanks to Shannon Noonan for being a fierce advocate for diversity and inclusion. I would also like to acknowledge members of the UCSF Office of Diversity and Outreach who are here to serve as resources. Denise Caromagno, director of the CARE program and confidential advocate, will be available to meet with folks in case they want some additional emotional support. And she's in the back waving at you all. I would also like to acknowledge Brandon Barger, who is the program coordinator for the LGBT Resource Center, who will also stick around to ask questions about the LGBT Center's programming. This event centers the voices and experiences of the trans community. And as we celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility, we want to reaffirm our commitment to the trans community and to all gender identities. We know there's much more to be done, and today is one step to increase the visibility of our trans siblings who are doing outstanding research in community work. We see you, we value you, and we definitely want to let you know that you belong here. And now help me welcome Sean Demons from the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health, who will moderate today's event. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sean Demons, and as Clint said, I work at the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. Uh, there I lead our SEBA services where we provide capacity building and technical assistance for uh, community-based organizations, public health department, and other public health professionals on how to improve their services for transgender people. So today's program, the structure is, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, each of our three presenters here today. That'll be followed by a panel discussion and then questions from you all. So first up today, you will hear from Charlotte Tate, and they will be talking about the psychological processes related to being transgender. Following Charlotte, we'll have Luis Guterres Mock, and Luis will be explaining health disparities and HIV in transgender communities. And third, uh, we'll have Carissa, and Carissa will explain how life experiences and social environment lead to changes in the way genes are expressed and how this can influence our understanding of gender identity. So without further ado, why don't we welcome our first speaker to the stage, Charlotte. All right, hi everyone. I'm Charlotte Tate, and I'm here today to talk to you about some uh, psychological science. Some of you may not think we do science in psychology. Some of you may think all we do is have people sit on a couch and look at them and say, you're a good person, move on. Um, but that's not, <laughs> that maybe that is part of what some people do, <laughs> but that's not what I do. Um, so what I wanna do is tell you about some research that I've done uh, looking at both transgender spectrum uh, and also cisgender uh, experiences. Uh, and as a trans woman, um, I want you to know here that uh, my team is also uh, part, part, it's in part uh, staffed by also other non-binary folks. Uh, so this is really like lots of trans visibility. So trans women and non-binary folks actually trying to think about our experiences as such and then be able to create larger scientific models to actually uh, test using statistics in the way that uh, most of what um, the rest of psychology that's not helping people actually does. Uh, so also, just so that you know, you can live Twitter this. Uh, you may have think I made a mistake there. Tweeting is for birds. Twittering is a, an activity for people. Um, so you can live Twitter this. That's my Twitter handle, Dr. Charlotte Tate. Um, so what I want to be able to tell you about now is no one understands their gender like this. Um, for those of you who might not be able to see it very well, it's two little kids looking in their pants. Uh, presumably at their genitals or just as kids do, just having fun. Uh, but the reason I actually need you to understand that that's not how people understand their gender is because this is the reigning medical model of how people do this. Uh, there's lots of focus, lots of interest in just saying, oh look, all we do is just look at our genitals and yay, 
gender in all of its forms is actually there. Now, those of you who are in the medical profession, you know that genitals are a consequence of lots of interesting genetic and hormonal processes, and they actually have some amount of at least genetic and hormonal predictive power in the future, but they are not gender. Um, and so what I want to be able to tell you is that we need to actually think about gender in a new and different way. And that's part of what I task myself as a psychological scientist to do. I'm also then going to define some terms for you. I'll also tell you about the, our methodology, which is how to assess gender identity profiles using surveys. Uh, there are critiques of survey research, but remember surveys, people responding to surveys is a behavior. Uh, and so I situate myself as a behavioral scientist, not a social scientist, because I watch people's behavior and look for patterns in it. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. We'll also have some statistics, which surprisingly work well on behavioral results. Um, and I'll tell you about that and how we're focusing on gender identity, as I'll define it, as separate from lots of other constructs uh, that uh, are associated with gender. And then I'll wrap up. Uh, so you should also know that, um, this is a nice PowerPoint animation, uh, <laughs> but I'm part of a group of people uh, in psychological science and in associated fields like in neuroscience where we're actually trying to think differently uh, about gender. So I have to come up here and just tell you that's what's happening. So um, if you thought this was going to be, you know, the uh, 1970s or 80s version of gender talk, nope, it's not. Uh, in fact, this is uh, from the, one of the most recent issues of the American Psychologist. Um, so we're trying to actually break the current understanding of the gender binary and actually have us think about it in lots of different ways. Now, what I also want to tell you is that what I think as a scientist is that we should think about gender as a bundle of constructs. This also is not a new idea. What I did with this paper, which is in the Review of, G of General Psychology, is we focused on how everyone in medical science, in behavioral science, in social science, and in related humanities like gender studies and other places have actually been talking. And what they've been doing is talking about gender in at least five different ways, or five different facets as we talk about it. And so what we're going to be able to do and what we need to do is actually focus on how do we separate these facets conceptually and then measure aspects of them in a manner that allows us to understand what gender is actually like both writ large and in these specific components. Now I recognize I'm giving a talk. This is not an exciting figure for a talk. So let's say that gender arrives as a bundle. You kind of get it from Amazon Prime or one of the other services that you use. Um, and oh look, outfall all of those things. You might have missed it, so here it is. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who are young in your scholarship years, this is the height of academic comedy. This is what you can do. Uh, <laughs> And it, it, it may just, there might be a ceiling effect. It doesn't get more exciting than that. But <laughs> what I want you to think about is things that we already know about parts of this bundle. So we have birth assigned gender category, which is just basically looking at people's genitals and giving them uh, a designation. But people experience their gender in lots of different ways. There's also the self-categorization, which is how a person understands who they are and how they are in the world. That may differ from what they were birth assigned. Uh, but then separately, we've got gender roles, social presentation, which has a lot of things like how you modulate your voice, the kind of clothes you wear, the hairstyle, et cetera. And we also have how we evaluate uh, ourselves inside of a gender group and other people that we associate with that gender group and others. Um, so the idea here is that I want to, both professionally and in this talk, focus us that transgender should just mean a calculation between birth assigned category label and current identity. Nothing else. But to have the American Psychological Association tell it to you, no one is cisgender unless they not only have the same label for those, but they also are heterosexual, and they participate in traditional gender roles, and they evaluate people in traditional ways. That is an unuseful definition, and that was in part what the American Psychologist article was about. Interestingly enough, the APA publishes that journal, so they were like, sure, say that, <laughs> and we did. Uh, but what I need you to know is that a lot of people take a shortcut. And what they do is they focus on birth assigned gender category, they focus on gender roles, and the reason they're doing that is because they want to get to sexual orientation really quickly. Here's how they do it. They spin the gender roles wheel. It's like Wheel of Fortune. Um, they spin the gender roles wheel and they're just like, oh, if you have stereotypical gender roles, then you're heterosexual. But let's spin the gender roles wheel again, and if you have non-stereotypical uh, gender roles, then you're gay. Yay, we've solved it. Uh, but 
then you, you might think that is a terrible way to think about it. It in fact is, <laughs> that it in fact is the reigning model in psychology and associated sciences of how we've been doing it. So what we should do, watch the, the situation closely, just break that up. Um, if you missed it, that's a little shatter animation. <laughs> just break it up. So we know that this is what's happening. We can't and should not think about gender as any smaller than a five-dimensional object. Um, and sexual orientation is nice and good, but what I'm gonna do professionally and not for this talk is connect current identity, not birth assigned category, to sexual orientation. And then remember that sexual orientation also has reverberations to gender roles, to social presentation, et cetera. I'm a butch lesbian, so that's partly how I identify myself, both as a woman and as a lesbian. Uh, so it's a complex model that we actually have to pay attention to, and obviously in 10 minutes or so that I'm giving you this talk, I'm not gonna be able to talk to you about all of the specificity of it, but I need you to understand this is how big it is, and this is how scientifically we approach it. So recall, what I'm doing is just talking about cisgender and transgender as being some description of where people's birth assigned labels start, which remember, they didn't start out, someone looked at their genitals and said, hey, I'm gonna give you this category, and they were like, I'm a baby. I have no <laughs> representation of that. And then at some point, they said, oh, this is my identity, and the calculus is between those two time points, and that can be at any point. So cis, let's just go back to our Latinates. Cis means same, um, so same label. Uh, trans uh, means across or beyond, so different labels. That's it. So I'm gonna talk to you about cis men, cis women, trans men, trans women, and I'm gonna also try to convince you with some data that these are binary identities, <clears throat> meaning people think about themselves as one category and not the other. That's different from genderqueer or non-binary individuals who may think about themselves as not exclusively one category <clears throat> or the other. And so when I use transgender spectrum, what I'm trying to do scientifically is actually collect <clears throat> two sets of experiences, one that is binary and one that is non-binary, so we need to keep that in mind. So remember, this is the real deal. Gender is not any smaller than this, and if we wanna think about sexual orientation, that's exciting, but not for this talk. Um, so, just to remind you before we get into a more particular description, a lot of people have spent time talking about gender in the way of doing gender. But in this five facet model, doing gender is really gender roles, social presentation, and evaluations. We really have not been spending any good time on what I have called in that article and other places, being gender. This idea of how we categorize ourselves. And what I wanna be able to convince you of in a 10 minute talk, which I know is a tall order, um, is that even cisgender folks are being gender. It's not that they're just like, oh, you know, I'm tired, I'm just gonna stick with my birth assigned label. <laughs> I think they're actually doing something active as well. Um, so I need you to understand that. So how would we actually figure out um, this information about how people have this self-categorization? Well, we know it's probably not what I just described to you, the doing of gender. And when you ask trans spectrum folks, and for those of you who may have been able to recognize some of the pictures I had uh, up early, uh, like uh, Janet Mock and Chaz Bono, what they oftentimes spend time telling people about is this idea of feeling like the category. So for Janet Mock, she, feel, she felt like a woman or a girl when she was younger, and it wasn't because she did things that were traditional gender roles, it wasn't because she wore dresses, it wasn't those types of things. There was a deeper kind of feeling that she had that was articulable at that level. And these, of course, gender roles, visual presentation, evaluations, are all interpersonally visible. We have terrible language for it, but at least we have some language. Masculine, feminine, over and over again, for your clothes, <laughs> for how you act, for other types of things. So we have language. But this construct is really difficult to get at because people oftentimes can just report, I feel this way. It's a sense of who I am. And then someone will be like, but what about roles? Tell me, tell me, did you like dresses? Did you like, no. <laughs> it was a, a sense of who I was. So the question becomes how, in a behavioral science, do you measure something that you have very little language for? Well, nicely for us, an analog might help. So other behavioral scientists like Art Aaron and his colleagues had a parallel but different problem, which is how do you actually ask people how much they care for someone else? If you asked in specific language terms, you would get people saying, well, I, with my girlfriend, we quilt afghans and watch Orange is the New Black, and someone would be like, that's not how you love someone. You have to do something different. So if you just use all these linguistic things, it would actually start to become different across people. So maybe go to a situation that's visual. 
where what you can do is ask people, do you include that person in your sense of self at different degrees, including n not at all? And this is now a way to actually get around the idea that how specific people would talk about their closeness using specific language would be different. So can we adapt something like this, a measurement tool that is visual in nature and uses some of the same principles to track how people feel about being categorizable into a gender? And that's what we did. So we created something called the Gender Self Overlap Index. And you can see here it starts out with yourself, and then it's going to give specific categories. I'm just showing female for right now, but there are more than that, and I'll show you that. And you can see that you can overlap not at all to completely overlap with that category of being. And it comes in, in grayscale as well. Um, and so what you can see here is that what we do is we ask people that for female gender identity, for male, for trans female, for trans male, and also for gender queer. Um, so we're asking people to make, and what this allows us to do is make comparative judgments. So we can ask cisgender folks, transgender folks, we can ask them how much they overlap with a female identity and a male identity at least, and others too, to really start to uncover using statistics this idea of whether there is this binary kind of opposition. Do people, some people say, I feel like this category and not like that category. So that's what we're going to be able to do. We're going to be able to actually do this using exemplars of cis women, trans women, cis men, trans men, and non-binary folks. And I'm from the 90s, so we didn't use sneak pre we didn't use uh, spoiler alert. We used sneak preview because um, we went to the movies. The movies were actually good in the 90s. Um, they're no longer good. So sneak preview, I'm going to try to convince you that binary folks are more similar, cis and trans, to each other, um, and that non-binary folks are actually s different using that kind of measure. So to tell you exactly how we figure out who's uh, cis and trans, what I want to be able to show you is that we've published a method to actually assess this, which asks two questions. How do you currently identify, and what were you assigned at birth? And we give as many categories as we think are uh, plausible in the United States. And what you'll be able to see is that if people have the same responses, they're considered cisgender. If they have different responses, they're considered transgender. And what we showed in this Journal of Sex Research article is that you actually gain more data than you lose compared to other types of methods, including inclusive one-question methods. All you need to really understand from there is that we're using this in order to figure out who's cis and who's trans. That's it. And it comes in noun form. So again, here's self-report stuff. Again, you might think, like, self-report? Yes, self-report has issues, but lots of other methodologies have issues as well. But we have people take our gender self overlap index. They also take other kinds of measures that are supposed to be about the other facets of gender. And what I want to be able to then to do is show you using a discriminant function analysis that we're going to test whether the gender self overlap index actually recovers who identifies as cisgender uh, or transgender. And then we had some secondary materials. So here is the description of the participants. We had 376 cisgender women and men. And this figure doesn't show up very easily given the color scheme, but I always think about these things and then someone has floodlights <laughs> up here. Um, but all I want to be, you to be able to see is that all of those different uh, measures that I told you about that are about other facets of gender do no discrimination of who is cisgender as a woman or a man. What does the discrimination is the gender self-overlap female item and the male item. And they have opposite signs relative to each other, which shows you as you go in opposite directions on either, then you get the categorization. So cis women actually have a higher overlap on female and a lower overlap on male. Cis men have the inverse, the higher on male, lower on female. So that's cool. We were excited about that. But will it work for trans women and trans men? Sneak preview. Yes, it did. <laughs> so there it is, and it works exactly well. Just to compare the two sets of findings for you, that's what they look like side by side. These are standardized coefficients, so you can more directly compare them. And it may be that the transgender uh, women and men are just more used to talking about this felt sense of being than cisgender folks are, but you get exactly the same results. So that's my statement to you that probably what's going on psychologically is very similar between uh, cis women and trans women, cis men and trans men. And just to also show that to you in another way, this is a linear discriminant analysis histogram. Um, the LDA stands for linear discriminant analysis. Histogram stands for histogram. There it is. Um, and so you can see here at the zero point that you get, and it's doing this, in, we use R, so it's doing it alphabetically. Cis men and trans men are graphs uh, one and three and uh, cis women and trans women are graphs two and four. And you can see that the men are much more similar to each other 
uh, and the women are much more similar to each other. And the differences in categorization are actually in a, what's called a confusion, confusion matrix. It's cis women being mistaken for trans women and vice versa. It's cis men being mistaken for trans men and vice versa. That's what ends up happening there. Now, in terms of trans women and men, what relevantly want to show you this, that there is basically no overlap between these groups on the G-soy items. Um, so that is an inciting and important for you to know for the following reason. We now want to talk about non-binary folks. And so there is an idea that non-binary folks are not necessarily a different kind of gender experience, but what they are is just people talking about gender roles and doing gender roles differently. That's an interesting idea, probably wrong. Sneak preview, it is wrong. <laughs> but if you wanted to think about it that way, you should also subject it to some kind of scientific analysis. So one way to think about this is if there are potentially two classes of non-binary experience, people who have this kind of co-gender sense, a combined sense of being male and female simultaneously or alternately, and those who actually think about having no categorization with respect to female and male, an agender sense, then what may happen is we could use those G-soy items, the female and male items, in a following way. We would expect a similar response set. So people who have this combined sense would be high uh, on the female item, high on the male item, people at a neutral sense would be low on both. And in our discriminant function analysis, that would actually be, rather than two signs that are different from each other, two signs that are the same. That's what could happen. So that's, a, that's interesting and exciting. And just so that you know, in this two-question technique, what we do is if people identified that they were genderqueer or non-binary, we gave them several different kinds of options to be able to choose from. So one of the sets that I'm showing you here is just, you could think about androgynous, bigender, intergender, gender blender as a potential sense of being combined, having a combined sense of being female and male. Uh, differently gendered or post-gender might be senses of actually being agender. And this could work potentially, except that in talking with non-binary scholars who have these experiences, these observational experiences, including my co-authors, they were like, or not. Because what seems to be missing is that a person could identify as differently gendered, post-gendered, bi-gender, whatever, and what's missing is this idea of a presence or absence of core gender itself. And so being a binary person, I was like, hmm, I kind of missed that, but good for me to know, good for me to actually uh, consult with people. So rather than actually doing that, what we can do is just ask ourselves, well, how are those items correlated? those female and male items. And you can see here, they're correlated at basically zero. For comparison, for trans women and trans men, they are correlated at almost four times higher than zero. So uh, that shows us that we're actually getting a different pattern from the start. So what it also helps us see is that non-binary folks actually have a different response pattern, which may indicate that they are having a different experience of how they're working with the same tool, which can recover um, a binary identity uh, for trans women and trans men as well as cis uh, women and cis men. So the idea is that we should actually, in the future, uh, focus on getting another measure that looks at this kind of presence or absence of gender. So given that, we can actually see our non-binary folks actually showing a different response pattern than trans women and, and trans men as binary transgender folks. Sneak preview, they do. Um, so in a three-group discriminant function analysis, you get two functions. That's fun math. Um, and so in function one, you can see that what you have is trans men and trans women being separated from each other, but non-binary folks are not being separated from either group. So it shows that it's still working to separate the binary folks, but the non-binary folks are not being separated on function one. Where they get separated is on function two. You can see that more non-binary folks are on this side of the graph than there are binary trans folks. And what that can indicate for you, if we wanted to give you another way to represent this, which is a biplot, what you can see is that the G-soy male and G-soy female items really separate trans women and trans men. But non-binary folks are not separated by that because they're in the middle here. What seems to separate them is the importance of gender to their identity. There's more variability on that dimension. And also how much public regard people think, non-binary people think, non-binary folks have in the public. So what we're seeing here is that this importance to identity may be a kind of indirect way of getting at this presence or absence dimension in these data. And so what I wanted to be able to now tell you is that I forgot to put in a discussion slide, but this works too. Um, so what we're showing here is that we can actually use uh, statistics uh, and the larger scientific method to actually demonstrate 
that there are different experiences, and that's why we should call it a transgender spectrum. Um, binary and non-binary folks seem to be demonstrably different, at least here. And if we focus on gender in this new way, um, as uh, my lab and others are doing, then we actually get interesting information. So that's what I wanted to, to tell you. If you want to follow me or find me in places, you can. I'm on Facebook, Charlotte Tate, PhD. Got around their real name policy there. They're like, that's a real last name. <laughs> but it's just PhD. Um, and you can also find me uh, on, on Twitter at Dr. Charlotte Tate. So thank you for your attention. All right, so I have something to aspire to now one day with my PowerPoints. Um, <laughs> thank you, Charlotte, for just letting me know that that height is achievable. <laughs> we won't reach it with mine. Um, so I'm Luis gutierrez Mock. I work at the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. I'm currently a project director for the Triumph Project, which is a PrEP demonstration project. PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's a daily pill to prevent HIV. And I've been at the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health for a little over 10 years now. I've been in a lot of different roles there. And I'm also currently a doctoral student in medical sociology here at UCSF. So just to start off with, who wants to guess at how many trans people there are in the United States? Yeah. A few years ago, that was pretty much where we were at with the knowledge of how many trans people there are in the United States. Um, so there were a lot of different um, population estimates that were done. The California LGBT Tobacco Use Survey created an estimate of 0.1% in 2003 and in 2004 with the survey that they did. Los Angeles County estimated 0.2% in 2012. The Williams Institute provided an uh, average uh, estimate of all of the previous estimates that had occurred in 2011 and found a 0.3% prevalence. In 2012, we had the very first um, sort of population-based, you know, like besides the California uh, LGBT tobacco use survey, the first population-based study designed specifically to look at the population of trans people. It was a Massachusetts landline survey, and they found 0.5%. That was published in 2012. How many people in here have a landline? Yeah, one, maybe two, right? So that probably missed a couple of people, three. Three, you were ashamed of it though, I saw that. So then we had this really amazing opportunity that was created because the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or the BRFIS, is a state-specific population-based survey that collects information on a variety of different health indicators uh, via both landlines and cell phone lines. So the 2014 BRFIS contained an optional module that asked if the respondent was transgender, and then if so, you know, further probed about that. And so this optional module was available to states, and 19 states opted into this, this module. And the Williams Institute used multi-level regression and post-stratification to estimate the total trans population for the remaining states, providing us with a 0.6 population estimate for trans people. And you know, we can see that as all of the population estimates have occurred, they've only just kind of increased and increased and increased. We started with 0.1% from the California LGBT tobacco use survey to then 0.6 with, the, with the, uh, this data from the BRFIS that the Williams Institute uh, did post-stratification on. Unfortunate news uh, that um, these optional modules are now no longer available in the BRFIS data set. Um, so I encourage everybody to continue to vote and um, you know, hopefully we can have a change in administration that will be able to allow us to have these optional modules in because this provides so much um, for, you know, in terms of arguing for why trans health should be funded. Sari Reisner um, and several other researchers in 2015 published a fantastic review of trans health research by year. And you can see just this like exponential growth that happened. And it's kind of like, well, what happened with that? What happened was is that we had an election in 2008 that then provided really a sea change in terms of funding for, HI, for transgender health and you know, sort of public health funding for trans, um, trans health issues. Um, I also want to note that just in 2008, when, when these researchers started their, uh, the analysis within this lit review, the, the American Medical Association published a, a very important statement in support of trans health. 
um, that really, they, they said that there's a body of medical research that demonstrates the effectiveness and medical necessity of both of mental health care, hormone therapy, and sex reassignment surgery as therapeutic treatment for trans individuals. And so because of this, the 2008 um, statement from the AMA, that is really what was used for you know, the, the ACA arguments that, that trans people should be covered under ACA, that hormones should be covered under ACA. So that was all part of that. Um, I'm going to focus, my research mainly focuses on HIV uh, prevention, HIV treatment and care. Um, there's a variety of different reasons for this. I've been doing HIV prevention in a variety of different methods in almost every single type of uh, position that there is for HIV prevention for about 20 years now. I clearly started when I was 10. Um, and so the, you know, just really thinking about the enormous impact of HIV in trans communities. And uh, HIV is interesting to me. It's, I think it's especially compelling because it's just really a disease that highlights social inequity. You know, that's, that, that's what HIV ultimately boils down to. It's, it's looking at social inequity via a disease. And so we have, um, there was a, a systematic uh, meta-analysis that was uh, published in 2013 in The Lancet. It looked at 15 countries, including the US. Uh, they had a total N of 11,066 trans women, and they found that the overall HIV prevalence in the sample studies was 19.1%. And then the, the odds ratio for being infected with HIV compared for transgender women compared with other adults of reproductive age across all countries was 48.8. Um, and so, you know, we, we see that just this enormous impact of HIV in trans communities. Um, the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health and many of our colleagues and many other trans people were really instrumental in pressuring the CDC to change their data collection forms, and we were finally able to do so starting in 2009. It took um, you know, 20 years of advocacy to be able to get the CDC to shift their data collection and so that we could be able to accurately separate out trans populations. Trans women were previously subsumed under the MSM category. And so you see just you know, still the enormous impact of HIV. There is, there is still a lot more that needs to be known for trans men in HIV, and then we still know very, very little about uh, non-binary folks in HIV, and that is a huge field that needs further research. I was previously the project coordinator on the TTAC project, which was a HRSA SPINS funded project. It's a special projects of national significance, and HRSA is Health Research Resources and Services Administration. Um, it's a federal entity that, um, you know, they, they have the Ryan White program under HRSA, and so it's the, the largest funding source for HIV care in the United States. So we were tasked here at UCSF with evaluating nine demonstration sites across the United States that were um, creating interventions to attract and retain HIV-positive trans women of color into treatment and care. These are just uh, some of the baseline predictors of undetectable viral load. So the, the purpose of the study was to get uh, women who were not currently in HIV care into HIV care and then retain uh, folks and, and get folks to be adherent to their meds. And so we can see that at baseline age, Latina ethnicity, disclosing trans identity, healthcare empowerment, and currently being on hormones were positively associated with an undetectable viral load. Social support from trans friends, being homeless, and facing transportation barriers were negatively associated with undetectable viral load. And that's just all at the baseline. Uh, some of my independent research that I'm doing off of this sample was um, during one of our grantee meetings, we had uh, some of the intervention staff themselves say, we want to know what's going on with us. We want to know what's going on with the, the intervention staff, the, the people who are delivering this intervention to our communities. And so the research question is really, what's the impact of delivering peer-based HIV treatment interventions on trans women of color intervention staff themselves? And so I interviewed um, 19 trans women of color staff, and so this was all of the, the intervention staff who were trans women of color uh, and used grounded theory methodology. Just some of the larger themes that came up were around professionalization or paraprofessionalization, so the processes for people in um, in, in gaining employment and getting to work for many of the staff members. This was their first, you know, job that they've had. And so, you know, kind of learning how to have a job and how to show up to work on time. Really thinking through survival and that the motivators for doing this work was around individual and community level survival. 
emotional labor, and then resilience. You can see my sociological training within some of this. The part about this that excites me the most is that I really see that the motivation for this work from the intervention staff is based on community and individual survival, this desire for survival from communities. So this participant said, I know how difficult it is for me to be transgender. I know how difficult it is to be homeless. So it's kind of like going back in the past and helping people, but not necessarily going back in the past because it's the future for me. It's a very rewarding program for me. On to some of my other projects I'm doing. So this is the um, PrEP project. That's again, the daily pill to prevent HIV. Our goal is to develop a culturally relevant intervention um, really driven by the experiences of trans women of color. Our, this intervention is open to all trans identified individuals and uh, the California research, the California AIDS, HIV AIDS research program funded three sites across the state to conduct, um, to develop and implement interventions to get trans communities onto PrEP and we'll be able to pool all of that data and we will have a large enough sample size of non-binary individuals and trans men, which is going to be very exciting. And then also, I'm gonna use a sneak preview. Um, Sari Reisner is getting ready to publish um, a, a data set of, I believe, 800 trans men in PrEP uh, from his clinic that he has over at Fenway and he's going to be presenting on it at the National um, Transgender Health Summit, the pre-conference PrEP day. And so that, that's going to be very exciting. Just some of our intervention components that we have from the Triumph site. We have sites in both Oakland and in Sacramento. We're providing PrEPs uh, sort of bundled with hormones. So PrEP is being provided at the time of trans competent care. We have a very robust peer navigation. We do monthly group groups. We have a group medical appointment model. Um, we have PrEP champions and then co community mobilization. And we're still enrolling right now, so we're not we're not really presenting on any of our, our quantitative data or on any of our dried blood spot sample data. So we, we, we take uh, DBS dry blood spot samples um, every three months from our participants to really measure adherence to PrEP in addition to folks completing a survey every three months. And so we currently have 131 individuals enrolled into our study. And you can see the, you know, at, we've had 96 people complete the one month. 74 complete month three, 50 month six, 33 month nine, and 20 people have completed the entire study. And so that's just a little bit about some of the research that I've been involved in. Um, and I just encourage everybody, if you have not already heard about the National Transgender Health Summit, it is going to be happening this weekend. And um, if you have further questions about it, you can talk to myself, Clint, or Sean, who will be moderating. Thank you. So, what does it mean to be a woman? Everyone knows that we women all have XX chromosomes, right? Well, that's not actually true. Did you know that some women are mosaics? They have a mixture of different cells with different chromosome types like X with XY and even XXX. So, if being a woman isn't just about chromosomes, then what is being a woman about? Getting married, being feminine, having kids? You don't have to look far to find fantastic exceptions to all these rules, but we all share something that makes us women. Maybe that something is in our brains. You might have heard old-fashioned theories about men being better at math because they have bigger brains. Well, these theories have been debunked. For example, an elephant has a brain three times bigger than the average man but that doesn't mean the average man is three, the average elephant is three times smarter. <laughs> There's a new wave of, of neuroscientists that are showing important differences in the brain between females and males in neuron connectivity, in brain structure, in brain activity. They're finding that the brain is a patchwork mosaic. Women tend to have mostly female patches mixed with some male patches. 
So with all this new data, what does it mean to be a woman? Well, this is something that I've thought about possibly more than anyone in this room. When people learn that I'm a woman who happens to be transgender, they always ask, how do you know you're a woman? As a scientist, I'm searching for a biological basis. I want to understand what makes me, me. Well, new discoveries at the very front edge of science are revealing the biomarkers that define gender. My colleagues and I are exploring the neuroscience, the physiology, and the psychology of gender. These are vastly different fields, but they all share a common connection, and that is epigenetics. In, in epigenetics, we study how the activity of our DNA can radically and permanently change, even though the DNA sequence stays the same. So DNA is a long string-like molecule that winds up inside our cells. And it turns out that the way our DNA is wound up or even knotted can actually change the way our genes express themselves. And external factors in our lives can change the tightness and shape of those knots. You can think of it like this. Inside our bodies, there are trillions of cells. Each one of those is like a tiny microscopic city teeming with activity. Thousands of strange but naturally occurring machine-like things are busily making life happen, building contraptions, connecting circuits, fighting infections. Here's one that's uh, glomming onto a piece of DNA and polymerizing that DNA. Here's another one that's carrying a large sack of neurotransmitters from one end of a neuron to the other. Don't I get hazard pay for that kind of work? <laughs> this one is something here that I've studied since 2001. This is an entire molecular factory called the ribosome, and some say this is the secret to life. Well, one of the stunning things about most of the contraptions inside our cells is that they're biodegradable, they dissolve, but new ones are made each day. So for example, in a neuron, even though the neuron uh, may live a long time, each protein in that neuron, its lifetime is measured on the time scales of days and weeks, not years. So you can think of it like a traveling carnival where carnival rides are taken down and then put back together again. But one big difference between the traveling carnival and our cells is that for a traveling carnival, skilled craftsmen rebuild the carnival rides. But inside our cells, there are no skilled craftsmen, only simple, dumb molecular machines. And these molecular machines build what's written in the plans, no matter how the plans read. So these plans are actually the DNA, the instructions to build every nook and cranny inside our cells. Well, here's a riddle. If almost everything in, say, our brain cells dissolves every day, namely the proteins, how can the brain remember anything past one day? Well, that's where DNA comes in. DNA is one of those things that does not dissolve. However, to remember that something happened, the DNA has to record that event by changing itself when the event happened. But it's not the sequence of the DNA that changes. If that changed, then we might grow like a new ear or new eyeball every day. So instead, the DNA changes shapes, and that's where those knots come in that we were talking about a minute ago. You can think of the knots like DNA memory. So when something happens to you, like a childhood trauma, stress hormones flood the brain, and these hormones, they don't change the sequence of your DNA, but they do change the shape. So this burst of hormones affects the piece of DNA containing the instructions for molecular machines that reduce stress and this piece gets tied up into knot-like structures. So the dumb builder machines can no longer access the DNA, and they can't build the stress-reducing machines anymore. And this is what happens on the micro scale. On the macro scale, you lose the ability to deal with stress, and that's bad. And these knot-like structures persist sometimes for our entire life. And this is how DNA can remember what happened in the past. So I believe that's what was happening to me when I started a gender transition. Back then, even though I was a woman on the inside and I wore women's clothes on the outside, everyone still saw me as a man in a dress. And in science, where your credibility is everything, people were snickering in the hallways, giving me stares, looks of disgust, even afraid to be near me. I remember my first big conference talk after transition. It was in Italy. 
I'd given talks at prestigious conferences before, but this one, I was terrified. I looked out into the audience, and the whispers started, the looks, the smirks, the chuckles. To this day, I still have social anxiety around my experience eight years ago. I felt like no matter how many surgeries I had, even if I were indistinguishable from a typical woman, most people would never acknowledge me as a woman. I lost hope. Well, don't worry, I've had therapy, so I'm okay. I'm okay now. But I said enough is enough. I'm a scientist. I have a doctorate in astrophysics. I've published in the top journals in space physics, in wave particle interactions, nucleic acid biochemistry. I've been trained to get to the bottom of things. So I went online and I found fascinating papers. I learned that DNA knots are not always bad. In fact, nodding and unnodding is like a complex computer language that programs our bodies with exquisite precision. When we get pregnant, our fertilized egg develops into a newborn baby. During this process, thousands of DNA decisions are made. Should each cell in the embryo become a brain cell, a heart cell, a blood cell? Each decision occurs at a different time during pregnancy, some during the first trimester, some in the second trimester, and some in the third trimester. To truly understand DNA decision making, we need to see the DNA knots in atomic detail and how those knots form. But even the most powerful microscopes can't see this. Well, what if we used computers to simulate all of the atoms in the DNA knot system? Well, this would take one million laptops all put together. Well, that's exactly what we have in Los Alamos, <laughs> the um, Trinity supercomputer. So we have about a million processor cores hooked together in a big warehouse. And so um, this is one of our newer results that's going to be coming out in Journal of Computational Chemistry next week. Um, we can see the DNA making up an entire gene. So this is the first molecular dynamic simulation of an entire gene, including 427 nucleosomes, a billion atoms in total. And it's the largest simulation done to date in the biosciences. And so we're taking the first steps into understanding some unsolved scientific problems like how hormones can trigger the formation of DNA knots. Well, in addition, DNA decision making is shown beautifully in calico cats. The decision between orange and black fur is made early on in the womb. So the patchy pattern in the adult calico cat gives an exact readout of the DNA decisions that were being made when she was just a tiny little embryo in her, her mom's womb. And similar patchy patterns happen in human brains and in cancer tissue and are directly related to intellectual disability and breast cancer. Well, DNA decision making during development of the embryo also happens in other parts of the body. It turns out that the precursor genitals transform into either male or female during the first trimester of pregnancy, whereas the precursor brains, on the other hand, transform into male or female during the second trimester. And the current working model is that for women like me, a unique hormone mix in the womb caused the precursor genitals to transform one way, but the precursor brain to transform the other way. Well, most of epigenetic research has really focused on stress and anxiety and depression, sort of kind of you know downers and bad things. But nowadays, the latest stuff, people are looking at relaxation, the opposite of stress. So could relaxation change your DNA in positive ways? We're missing critical data from mouse models. You know, do mice meditate? We know they relax, but could a mice reach enlightenment like the Dalai Lama, or maybe move stones with their mind like Jedi Master Yoda? A Jedi mouse must feel the force flow. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the whole, like having friends and being in a loving relationship has given me hope and strength to help others at work. I wear a rainbow bracelet, and it raises eyebrows sometimes, but it also raises awareness. There are so many transgender people, especially women of color, that are just one degrading comment away from taking their own lives. It turns out that the suicide attempt rate among transgender people is 40%. So if you're listening and you feel like you have no other options, try to reach out, call a friend, go online, or find a support group. And for women who aren't transgender but know pain of sexual assault, of isolation, try to reach out. 
So what does it mean to be a woman? Well, the latest research is leading to a model where female and male brains develop differently in the womb, possibly giving us that innate sense of being a woman. On the other hand, could it be shared experience that gives us that sense of commonality? We come in so many different shapes and sizes that maybe asking what it means to be a woman isn't the right question. It's like asking a calico cat what it means to be a calico cat. Maybe becoming a woman means accepting ourselves for who we really are and acknowledging the same in each other. I see you and you've just seen me. Wow, thank you. Uh, can I have Luis and Charlotte join us up for the panel discussion? I just wanna say, this is the third TDLV event I've been a part of this season. And by far, the nerd in me is like super excited. <laughs> and as a trans person listening to the research, I, I'm just excited for possibilities and, and more visibility. So let's give another round of applause for Charlotte, Luis, and Carissa.